Hello everyone, this is Molly Anholm, and today we're going to take a look at the beautiful and famous sculptural work known as the Lion Capital that was made about 2200 years ago in India. We're going to address it in two different ways. First, we'll take a quick look at the notions of texture and pattern that the Lazari textbook Exploring Art highlights, and then we'll continue with a discussion of why this is such a significant historical work. First off, texture and pattern, and I'll also add abstraction. The book really focuses in on the great mane of the four lions, defining the repetitive nature of the texture on the manes as a pattern. But let's take this in another direction. We can also discuss how this lion is both representational and abstract. It's representational in that we recognize that we're looking at a lion. However, the lion overall is also a bit abstract. While we can see the representational style of the mane, the way it is carved suggests the coarse, thick fur around its neck in contrast to the much shorter fur of its body, but the perfect symmetry of those textured clumps of manes is, of course, not entirely naturalistic. It's kind of idealized, and we can also think of it as an abstraction. In art, the term abstract doesn't necessarily mean that there is no recognizable form, but rather that it is not a strict representation of reality. Think about it. If that were the case, the mane would be tousled, uneven, maybe even clumps of tangled hair here and there. The shorter fur also would not be so perfectly smooth as portrayed here. You get the idea. Everything's just a little too perfect. In that sense, this is an idealized representation of a lion. But moving beyond these stylizations and formal assessments, let's look a little deeper into why it was made at all. What is the Lion Capital? To start, the Lion Capital as we see it today is in a far different placement than its original function. Of course, we're probably looking at an image of the Lion Capital, but even if we were to see it in real life, if we were to go to the museum and see it and look directly at this seven foot tall sculpture in the round, walk around it, see it in real life, well, it would still be a quite different experience than how it was conceived to have been seen. First of all, the name Lion Capital tells us something about its use. It was a capital, meaning that it was originally placed on top of a column. Instead of looking at it directly then, we would be looking up, far over our head, even as much as 40 to 50 feet up. And then from far below, we would see these fierce lions with their mouths slightly agape, overlooking the vast regions far beyond what we could see down here 40 feet below them. So why were these lions carved and why were they carved as a capital to be set on top of these tall pillars? So let's look back at when they were made. The lion capital was created during the Mauryan Empire, which dates to 321 to 185 BCE and is among the earliest example of Buddhist art in existence today. King Ashoka ruled over the Mauryan Empire at its greatest height, bringing nearly all of the kingdoms throughout the Indian subcontinent under a single ruler for the first time in human history. After a particularly fierce battle with their strongest rival, the Kalinga Empire, in which tens of thousands died, the king changed course from a conqueror to a unifier and sought to bring peaceful unity to his empire. To fulfill these efforts, he is said to have converted to Buddhism and sought to use the philosophical teachings of Buddha to unify his empire. While this, of course, is a bit of a simplification of all the complexities of this situation, let's continue to see how the lion capital fits into the story. After the brief note on when it was made during the rule of King Ashoka, Let's consider where it would have been seen and why this matters. Again, it was a capital on top of a pillar. It wasn't just a sculpture hanging out somewhere in the king's palace, but it was meant to be seen by as many people as possible, loaded with symbolic detail, and atop of one of these pillars. In fact, this was one, the most famous one, of many such columns that often had a single lion or a bull standing or seated on top of the column. These columns are known as the Ashokan pillars and were a key part of the ruler's strategy to spread his message. So how does this column spread a message? 
At the base of the column, inscribed in different local dialects, were messages from the king to those who passed by that are collectively known as the Edicts of Ashoka. The writings inscribed on the pillar often began with the phrase, Thus speaks the beloved of the gods, the king, and continue with descriptions relating to the memories or activities of the king, its relation to Buddhist teachings, followed by statements about the public good. There are 33 known examples of these edicts. So let's take a moment to envision the scene. You're a person walking by this pillar 2200 years ago. You encounter this towering pillar reaching 40 to 50 feet tall with this great lion or bull on top of it. And it has this message inscribed on it. You read the message. And so you look back up at the animal seated on top of the pillar. What does this mean? Let's turn to the task of iconography, a term which refers both to the use of visual symbols in a work of art, as well as deciphering those visual symbols in a work of art. And let's break it down into three steps. The obvious, the iconography, and then we'll wrap that back up into the context that we've just been talking about. Step one, the obvious. Describe what you see. In this case, we see four lions arranged perpendicularly looking out straight forward. Their mouths are open, they look strong and fierce, but they are seated, so they don't appear to be launching an attack or anything like that, but they're strong and stout. As we look down, we see that there is a 24-spoked wheel at the foot of each of the lions. As we move around the pillar, we see between each of those wheels is a different animal. There is a lion, a bull, a horse, and an elephant. Below that, there is sort of an ornamental shape which you may or may not recognize. For now, we'll call it drapery because we're not quite sure what it means. And so there we have it, the starting point, the description. Now let's move on to analysis, decoding those images. For us today, this might take a little bit of research of digging into Buddhist imagery, Buddhist iconography, to understand what those details mean. Let's start with the lion. The lion has multiple symbolic meanings in Buddhist art. The lion was the symbol of the royal Shaka clan, that is the family that Buddha, before he became Buddha, was born into. He was Prince Siddhartha of the Shaka clan. He is sometimes referred to as the lion of the Shaka clan. It is also said that hearing Buddha's sermon was like hearing a lion's roar. And we see the lion here, its mouth is agape. Perhaps that's to represent that it is roaring. They are arranged perpendicularly, each 90 degrees apart. So conceivably, they're facing each of the four directions. And so when we add those pieces together, we can say that this is the sermon being spread in all directions. Moving down to the base again that the lions are seated on, that 24-spoked wheel is the Ashokan Chakra wheel. It is to represent the Dharma or the teachings of Buddha. As Buddhist art evolves and becomes codified over time, the official wheel that you will see in Buddhist art is refined and it only has eight spokes on it. But in this earliest of examples, there were 24. This brings me to another point. In these early examples of Buddhist art, we don't see that familiar portrayal of Buddha that we know of today. In fact, there were no figurative or human representations of Buddha at all during this early period. Buddha was only represented through symbolic iconography, such as the lion that we see here. Moving back to the base, between each of the wheels of the Dharma, there is an animal. Some say that these animals are representations of the four directions, which again underscores that idea that what we're seeing is a representation of the teachings of Buddha being disseminated broadly to the four directions. Taking the next step down to the drapery, well, of course, it's not drapery, and it's not just ornamental decoration, but it's actually an abstracted, idealized representation of a lotus flower in full bloom. And in Buddhist art, the lotus flower is a symbol of enlightenment. However, usually, the flower faces up just as it does in the real world. So it's a little unusual to see it facing down. Why would they do this? 
So if we go back again to think about the context of when, where, and how this would have been seen on top of this pillar and we're looking up to it after having read this message relating to the king and to Buddhism below it, and we see that the lotus flower is facing us. Perhaps it's bestowing its enlightenment down to us standing below this enlightening message. What a lovely thought. This about wraps up our quick discussion today of the Lion Capital. We looked at it in the context of the book. We did a little visual analysis, starting with description, analyzing the details, and putting those details into the context of when and why it was made. And as we close out, I encourage you to envision in your mind's eye the experience of seeing this Lion Capital instead of a photographic image only a few inches tall in a book or on a computer in its proper place with that textured mane appearing windswept as it sits some 40 feet above the ground, seated tall upon this monumental slender pillar of stone that bears a message of enlightenment to all who pass by. And consider the impact it may have had on those who did witness it in its original form. And again, as we conclude, I wish you all a great day. Thank you.